Now, in the first chapter of Genesis, we saw God's creation expressed. In chapter 2, there's a more in-depth expression of his creation, especially in regards to the creation of man and woman. So as we begin chapter 2, we're going to see kind of a, a recapping of events in chapter 1 and an expanding of it in chapter 2. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Basically, the rest of God that is being dealt with is not a physical rest, but is a moral rest. God had finished all the works that he was about to do or ever would do. In the book of Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 4, you see that this rest is mentioned as including salvation. He made, in other words, provision for man in every way. And so what he's doing now is he's taking what we call a moral rest from his work because all things have been finished and he needs no longer to do any kind of work. Now, he continues to work in our lives but has nothing to do to add to our salvation now that we're believers in Jesus Christ. And that's when he set aside a day, he sanctified it, and he rested from all his work which God created and made. Now, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So prior to rain, the Bible says there was a mist that would rise and would water the ground and keep it, um, keep it uh, moist and keep it lush. And this is what that water belt that I mentioned in chapter 1 accomplished in that it created a perfect a greenhouse effect on the earth. So there was a mist that constantly kept the plants in perfect health. In verse 7, the Bible says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. When it says in verse 7, The Lord God formed man, that word formed is a Hebrew word that means it's, it's he fashioned or he molded man. It shows the interest of a craftsman with his material. And what this is referring to is God's personal interest in human beings. You have seen in chapter 1 that he spoke all things into creation. He spoke the heavens and the earth into creation. He spoke the animal life into creation. He spoke the plant life into creation. He, he created everything with this word of his power. But when it came to him dealing with man, he formed man. And that shows his intimate relationship he has with us. It shows the care and the concern of a craftsman working with the materials. And so this is an intimate term here when it says that he formed man of the dust of the ground. And then it's even more intimate when it says, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Because that word breathed in the Hebrew literally refers to an intimacy face to face. It's the same kind of word that you use when somebody kisses somebody else. God gave to us the kiss of life. And this is what he did to man. Many times we wonder about our value. Many times we wonder if really worth, we're really worth that much. Most of us think we're not. Well, in and of ourselves, we aren't. In and of ourselves, we really don't have the value that we'd like to have. But when you respect the fact that God intimately created man, he formed man, and he breathed into man the breath of life in an intimacy that nobody else could possibly have. It demonstrates to me the intense value that God has for us. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant or beautiful, to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to, to water the garden and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which encompasses the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedalium and the onyx stone are there. You know, the 
when the Bible says something's good, it's good, you know. Wouldn't you like to know where this river Pishon is? You can go out on an excavation and find that good gold. Actually, the river Pishon is an unknown river now. We don't know where that existed, but we know that it's somewhere in the Mesopotamia Valley. The Mesopotamia Valley, and according to many cultural anthropologists, is what they call the uh, birthplace of civilization. And it's, uh, it is. You know, according to the biblical account, that's where man was placed, and so they're very right when they say that. And it had beautiful gold there, and it had bedallium and onyx stones. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which encompasses the whole land of Cush. The land of Cush is the east, east of the Tigris River, and that also is an unknown river. The name of the third river is Hedekel, which is the Tigris River, and it is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Notice that man was created with a purpose here in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to tend and keep it. Now, at this time, there was no curse. There he wouldn't even sweat. His, his position was just as a caretaker over God's garden, and he must have really enjoyed his life. I'm certain he did, just walking through the garden. That was something that he could do. He was in perfection in Eden. And as he walked through the garden, that was his job, just to walk through the garden. And just You know, there weren't dead leaves. There weren't any, 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 any things that were decaying. It was just a beautiful place to be. It's hard for us to imagine that. But God placed him there because man needed to have responsibility. Man needed to do something with his life. And so God placed him in the garden. And the Lord God, now here's where you see the free will issue dealt with. The Lord God commanded Adam. He spoke to him and gave him a command. A command speaks of a free will. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Now I want you to Keep these words in mind. Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat you shall surely die. What does he mean, die? Adam doesn't even know what death is. And yet God makes a commandment to him and he says, don't touch of it. Not don't, don't touch of it, but don't eat of it. Don't eat of it. In the day that you do, you're going to die. So Adam has this commandment locked into his consciousness. He is now accountable to God. As a free moral agent, he has a choice he can make. Will I obey God or will I not obey God? And he has this locked in. Anytime you hear the word of God preached to you, say before you were a Christian, you heard the word of God and your consciousness begins to become illuminated in terms of understanding that Jesus Christ is God and that he died on the cross for you, when your consciousness begins to be illuminated, the amount of knowledge that you have, you are accountable for. And we can never say, but nobody told me, but nobody warned me. Because you've had something locked into your mind. You've heard the message. Adam heard the commandment. He heard the commandment. He knew the commandment. God spoke to him and said, I don't want you to eat of it. But what's death? Adam has no idea what death is, and that shows me that there are many things that God does in my life and things that I don't understand right now that nonetheless have consequences. There are realities, in other words, that God works within our lives that when he speaks to us, we may not even understand what he's talking about, but we know for certainty the word of God says this, so we should obey what God has to say because there are times we don't know exactly the ramifications of our behavior, but God, who sees the future and knows all things, knows the ramifications of us breaking a, a commandment. In the same way that a child does not have a concept of fire being hot until they stick their hand in the fire. And the many times you've warned your children or you've warned the kids that you're watching, don't put your hand near that fire, it's gonna burn you. They don't learn that lesson until they stick their hand in the fire then you have to tell them this is what burning is. But you've told them, you've commanded them, you have known something, and you've told them not to do it because there are ramifications to them disobeying, and yet when they do, they learn through experience what it means. This is what's going to happen to Adam. He's been commanded not to eat of this tree of knowledge of good and evil. He's not to eat of it. God told him not to. 
And he said, you're going to die. But Adam, what is death? He's never even said a dead, seen a dead leaf, a dead animal. What's death? But God says, when you do it, you're going to pay the price. And so what happens? Well, we'll see in a minute. The Lord God said, now this is from God's heart, and this is neat. I, I like this passage here. The Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. The very first thing you see that God says is not good is man's loneliness or man without a helper. The very first thing that God says is not good is that man should be alone. We were not created to live in solitude. No man is an island, they say. One of the things that really make a difference in a human life and an animal life is when an animal gets hurt, generally they'll withdraw themselves and they'll snap at anything that comes near them while they're injured. You see that happen with dogs all the time. If they get hurt and you try and reach for them, they'll snap at you because they're hurting. Human beings are not created to live in isolation. It is a very unnatural thing for us to withdraw in our pain. What we need to do when we're hurt is reach out. The natural reaction we have, though, is to withdraw. What we need to learn to do is to reach out with our pain and say, I need to be touched by you. God said, it is not good for man to be alone. It isn't something I created you to be. Now, this is interesting because God was walking with Adam and had a relationship. There was a spiritual relationship between God and Adam. And yet God knew that there are human needs that man has that God created us with that even God's Holy Spirit isn't going to fulfill. Because not all of us have been called to be celibates. Jesus, in discussing marriage one day, said that there are different kinds of celibates. There are celibates who are born celibates. There are celibates who were made celibates by other men. And there are celibates who are celibate voluntarily for the kingdom of God's sake. And the apostles, when they were discussing marriage, said, well, you know, if marriage is supposed to be permanent, then it's good that man shouldn't even be married at all. And that's why Jesus had to deal with that. And he said, this is a commandment that only a few people can receive. In other words, I believe the majority of us have been created to be married. And if you have a question within yourself about whether or not you should be married, if you have a desire whatsoever to date and to be with, with the opposite sex, then obviously you're not celibate. And that should answer your question. So God created man to have companionship. And God said, it is not good that the man should be alone, and I will make him a helper. Now God created the perfect woman. He created Eve. We'll see that in a minute. Notice, though, he said, I'm going to make a helper comparable to him. That means corresponding to him, someone who is expressly, perfectly suited for the needs that he possesses. Notice that he did not say, I will make a helper better than him, or I'm making Adam better than his helper. What he said was, I'm creating somebody who is perfectly suited for him. So man is not better, and woman is not better. We need each other. And that was God's intention. Now notice this, God has made the statement, it is not good that man should be alone, I will make him a helper comparable to him, which tells me that God knows my needs before I know them. Now you would think in the human framework that the first thing God should have done when he, when he said that was God should have created the helper. But what did he do? He put Adam out there to work. It says, out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, and he brought them to Adam to see what he what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. Now, you've got to picture Adam. He said, well, that's a hippopotamus, you know, and that's a giraffe. And that looks like a platypus to me. And he's giving all these names to these beasts, you know, which shows the incredible creativity that is inherent in man to be able to do something like that. And there he is naming all these animals, but you know what he's also noticing? That there are males and females. And he sees these hippopotamus walking by holding hands, and he says to himself, <laughs> how come I don't have one to hold my hand? <laughs> and so he's watching them. I believe that God gave him the command to name the animals in order to give him uh, the awareness of his aloneness. So God knew how to awaken in Adam that need. So Adam's watching these animals go by, noticing that they're in pairs, and becomes aware of the fact, hey, I don't have anybody myself. And so what happens? The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. 
and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So God, I believe, still continues to do something like this. Now this is the original creation, but you know, some of us when we're single, when we're single we look for mates. You know, I had a history of that. Every girl I dated was going to be my next wife, or my first wife, you know, actually my first wife. <laughs> first wife. Marie's going to listen to this tape and she's going to wonder who these other wives were, you know. <laughs> and as a Christian, I started praying. Oh, God, I want her. You know, I want her. She's going to have blue eyes, blonde hair. She's got to love you, but as long as she's got blue eyes and blonde hair. And I can remember, you know, going to the singles things and, and enjoying them. I wasn't there to try and, and, you know, throw the make, but hoping that while I'm doing the right thing, maybe God will bring, you know, the right girl. And this, that was kind of where my attitude was, you know, and I got kind of lonely and stuff. And I went through two or three dating relationships and finally got to the point where I said, you know, Lord, I'm just too awake. I'm too awake to myself. I said, you know, I want to be put to sleep like Adam was. What I want is my flesh to be resting. I want it to be put to sleep. I want my desires to be put to sleep so that I might serve you. And as I died to those desires that I used to have, I met my wife. Marie came to a Bible study I was teaching in Ontario. She wasn't a Christian. She came just to investigate it, what's going on in this guy's house. And I met Marie, and through my ministry, my wife got saved. And then about three or four months later, we started dating, and then two years later, we were married. But I did not date my wife with the expectation of her being my wife. I dated her because she was fun, and God had changed my life through that simple prayer, God, you put Adam to sleep, put me to sleep too. And when he did, I was able to see that which God brought to me. Notice that God brought the woman to him. It says, the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. That word made is literally built. He built the woman, and, and according to what this says, he was really built. I mean, it's obvious. And Adam said, <laughs> this is now bone of my bones. <laughs> that was a bad joke, right? <laughs> this is now. Now, when he says this is now, I want you to notice the marital, the original marital relationship. Notice it. There's no mention of, of childbearing involved in this. You know, it's not as if woman was created only to have children. Woman was created to be man's friend and companion, primarily. Somehow in our marital relationships, we forget that sometimes, especially when we have children. And very often the wives will begin to spend so much time with the children that the man begins to feel left out of the wife's life. God originally created the woman to be the helper to the man, to be comparable to him. You know, something my dad taught me, and my dad was unregenerate when he taught me this, but it's true. He said one day as I came in to talk to him when I was about 18 or so, he said, David, he says, I want you to understand one thing about your mother and me. He said, we were married and we were together before you were born, and when you leave the house, we're still going to be together. He said, my first relationship is with your mother. And that's something that I really held to in my own philosophy of life. I love my children, my, my wife loves our children, but I believe our marriage needs to be safeguarded first. Our companionship and relationship needs to be securely uh, held together. Because in that way, as we're close to God, we can be good parents to our children and love them with the love God really wants us to have for them. Not getting too overprotective and overemphasizing our relationships as parents to our children, but learning to undergird that relationship with a proper relationship for each other. Eve originally was a friend and a lover, and then she became a mother. And that's how it goes. So Adam's looking and he said, this is bone of my bones. When he says this is now, it's a Hebrew phrase that's like he's saying, finally, this is it. This is what I was missing. He said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, now this notation here, I believe Moses added in verse 24. And notice, incidentally, before that, notice Adam had been naming animals. Well, this is the last naming that he does. This is the last naming. He named woman, woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. 
and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. You know, I believe that in marital relationships, very often the problems do not revolve between the husband and the in-laws. It's it very often is between. Um, let's put it this way: the problem is generally with uh, uh, with the with the husband's uh, mother in marital relationships because, and you, you've got to understand this, you know, mama has raised her boy all his life. She sewed for him, she cooked for him, she patched his little knees whenever they were hurt, she tucked him into bed for years. And here comes this woman taking away my baby. And we may chuckle over that, but that's true because there's just never going to be a woman good enough for my son. That's kind of the way we think because we've given our lives. So in marital uh, counseling, when there's in-law problems, it's generally a problem between the daughter-in-law and the mother-in-law. And it generally revolves around those kinds of tensions. I think that's kind of why Moses said, a man shall leave. You know, some of you wives have heard this. You know, I don't know. I hope not. Or, you know, gosh, I wish you could cook like my mom. You know, my mom used to just always make sure that my shoes were shined. You know, my mom never complained about me leaving my underwear behind the door. <laughs> you know, that's kind of how we are. We have a tendency of comparing. God never called us to do that. I think we men need to leave and cleave. That word leave means literally sliced in half and separated completely. That's what the word leave means. The word cleave means to be adhered or cemented together. And it's like if you have tissue paper and you glue it together, how it becomes one single sheet. But if you get that tissue paper and pull it apart, it damages both sheets to the point of sometimes total disrepair. There's no way you can fix it. That's what divorce will do to your marriage. Because you are fragile and you've been joined together in God. And when you yank yourself apart, you can't help but destroy that which was cemented together. God originally intended us to remain together. In verse 25, it says, They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed, because in marriage there is no shame, and there was perfect innocence. Now, everything's beautiful. In chapter 3, here comes the enemy. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. This is the devil introduced in Genesis and he said to the woman, As God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now basically inherent in that question is a, is, is a, um, it's intended to cause Eve to question the goodness of God. And you'll see how this logic develops as we go through this. The very first thing the devil will do, though, when he's tempting and beguiling and deceiving, is he will begin to cause you to doubt the goodness of God. If God truly were God, he'd want you to have everything and all the fruit in the garden. If you were really God and he were really good, that's what he'd intend for you. So he makes this question in such a form that he's starting to question the integrity of God and God's word. And that's exactly what the enemy always does. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, did God say you shall need not eat of every tree of the garden? No. God said, don't eat the tree of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. But notice what he did. He said, hey, you know, has God said you shouldn't eat of every tree? Immediately restricting God. So what's the woman say? The woman says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. <coughs> Where did she get the idea that God said, don't touch it? I think there's two, two possibilities, basic possibilities. One is she added to the word of God. She interpreted it on her own. Or possibly Adam said, honey, don't even touch that tree. You know, I'm more of the opinion that Adam did that. That Adam said, you know, honey, don't even get near it. You know, the way we husbands sometimes are with our wives. You know, honey, don't even go near that. Just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. And so, you know, the commandment was, 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 well, he said not to eat it, but not even to touch it. No, God never said that. So that was a mistake. We add to it. We add to the word of God. You shall not touch it, lest you die. Did God say, lest you die? 
No, God said, you shall surely die. I mean, there was no doubt about it. You are going to die. Here's little Eve, you know, trying to deal with the enemy. Now she's outside of her covering relationship with her husband right now, dealing with the enemy, which is a very dangerous place to be. It says, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. God is a liar. You're not going to die, and you never will die. That is the germ of reincarnation. You're not going to die. What you're going to be is a bug next time. Or maybe you'll be a cow. Or maybe you'll be a better human being. But you're not going to die. And there are books written constantly telling us that, life after life. And from a secular perspective. You know, this is possible to have a continuing life existence outside of Jesus Christ and outside of God. You hear this all the time. So it's the lie of the devil, the original lie. When God said, when you disobey me, that breaks my relationship with you. That puts you in a sin relationship with me. And as a result of that, you're dead. You're a walking dead man. You are separated by your sin from me, and I cannot look upon sin with pleasure. Therefore, we are going to break fellowship. You shall surely die. And the devil says, no, you won't. You won't die. God's lying. He's a liar. That's what he's saying. He goes on, he says, God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. That's the second germ of Hinduism. You shall be like God is what they tell you you will be. As a matter of fact, I've read their material where they say you are divine. You are God. And you need to know that. That's Hinduism. That's where Hinduism comes from. People say, well, there's so many religions on the earth. You know, there's Buddhism, and there's Zoroastrianism, and there's uh, different philosophies, um, and, and there's Judea, uh, Judaism, and there's Christianity. Hundreds of religions. No, there's only two. There's God and his truth and the lie of the devil as it is expressed in different forms. But there's only two religions, the religion of God and the religion of the devil. And the religion of the devil has a variety of forms to it, which expresses itself in Hinduism and Buddhism and the different uh, philosophies that we have. And it originated here in the original fall. So what happens? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, notice how she's tempted. First she saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Women have an incredible influence over their husbands. That's just the basic, that's true. My wife can influence me like nobody else can. Like nobody else can. And, uh, and most of the time it's for good. Most of the time, almost all the time, it's for good. But if my wife had it in her to influence me to evil, you know, who knows what I would do for my wife. Because we husbands love our wives, and they can influence us like men can't or other women can't. It's our wives, and that's a special relationship. Eve took of this, she ate of it, and she gave it to her husband. Now, why did he eat? He knew what was going to happen. Nobody really knows. There are only conjectures, only possibilities. Could it be that Adam didn't want Eve to go into eternity without him? Could it be his love for her? I think so. I think he was willing to give up his relationship to God in order to remain with his wife. And I think that's sad. <laughs> that this happened. You know, when I was growing up and I heard this the first time, I was so mad at Adam and Eve. I said, man, I wouldn't have to go out and mow the lawn anymore and then pick up all that trash and stuff. You know, I was so mad because, because they fell. But they did. And he fell along with his wife. They both ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. They were aware of their relationship before God where at one time they were innocent, totally innocent, and their nakedness was an unashamed nakedness. Now they realize that they've broken the commandment of God and any time we transgress the commandment of God, we hide from him. And that's exactly what they did. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings, but who were they hiding from? I'm certain Adam had noticed that Eve was naked, and I'm certain Eve had noticed that Adam was naked. And yet, there they are hiding from who else? There's nobody else in the garden. And yet, here they are hiding. They're hiding themselves, and God knew it all along. They heard the sound 
of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? So it, the Bible says they heard the sound of the Lord. That sound is a Hebrew word that can also mean the calling out of God as God was going through the garden. The voice of God, in other words, was carrying through the garden. And Adam and Eve could hear the voice of God as he was calling. Now, the, when, when the Bible says he could hear him calling out, Where are you? It is not the cry of a man who is angry, looking for vengeance. It isn't like if, if God was angry and he was turning all the bushes over and he was yelling, Where are you? Where are you? You know, I'm going to get you. Sometimes we think of God like that, but that is not how he was calling. He was calling like a father who's lost his son. He was calling as a heartbroken daddy who's lost his baby. That's the cry of God. He was crying like you and I would cry if we couldn't find our babies. And we were screaming. When I was uh, about six years old, I, no, I must have been about eight, I, had a, I have a sister who's, who's six years younger than I. She was two years old. My mom and dad, I was at a park. My mom said, watch Rebecca for me. And being eight years old, you know, I could only watch her a few minutes, and off I was playing. And I went off and played until it got dark. I was in a park with a lot of people. A few minutes later, my mom goes, uh, you know, after I, it got dark and I came to my mom, she says, where's Rebecca? She said, I told you to look for her. I told you to take care of her. And I started crying, Rebecca. And I went through the park. <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget it. What had happened, his mom and dad had taken her to my aunt's house. But the cry was for someone lost. And that's how God called Adam. Where are you? He wanted Adam. And he called him. It's very touching. That's how much God loves us. He cried out, where are you? What was Adam's response? I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. We can never come to God in our own strength and our own righteousness because we'll always be afraid and we'll always hide ourselves. So God says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you? God is eliciting from him a confession, and the confession is not coming. God wants Adam to say, I disobeyed you, I knew what you told me to do, and I disobeyed. He's not doing that. He does what most of us do. The man said, well, the woman whom you gave me. <laughs> the woman you gave to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. It's not my fault. You know, there's actually two people at fault, God. You, because you gave me her, and her. You know, that we're so brave, aren't we? He blamed God. So God deals with the woman. The Lord God said to the woman, this is the second occasion of passing the buck in verse 13. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman said, well, it's the serpent. The serpent deceived me and I ate. It's the serpent's fault. You know, like Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it, right? That's what she was doing, classic. You know, I'm not responsible for my own life or my own behavior. It's really your fault because you're the one who created the devil in the first place. You're the one who created the woman, and you're the one who gave her to me. It's not my fault. So they were hardened and would not really confess. So what does God do? He, he, he does a curse. He says, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all cattle. And more than every beast of the field on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. What this is representative of is humiliating judgment, and the crawling is symbolic of that, that the enemy is figuratively and, and re really judged. And that's why we Christians, because we have a relationship with Jesus, have authority over the enemy. That's why we can resist the devil, and he will flee from us, because God has given us that victory in Jesus Christ. And so God curses the enemy here. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Where at one time there was a sympathy between you and Eve and uh, womankind in general, there is now enmity between you and her. And between your seed, that seed that God is already prophesying is recognized as being the Antichrist who will eventually make war. He says, your seed and her seed and her seed 
is Jesus Christ that God is already prophesying in Genesis 3.15, the first time you see it, a Messiah. God has already prepared, in other words, a Messiah. And you find it in Genesis 3.15. And there will be enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head. And when Jesus died on the cross and, and, and crushed the head of the serpent, he did that. And you shall bruise his heel. And that's when Jesus died. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Originally, Eve was to have children, but she would never have a hard pregnancy. And when she gave birth, there would have been no pain involved. And also, originally, the relationship through creation was man being created first was the authority in the life of the wife and she willingly through creation submitted when she went about making a decision on her own without consulting her husband without making a decision that should have been together she was in an act of rebellion and being in an act of rebellion that was firmly embedded in her nature now, man is rebellious also, but part of the relationship that woman has with man is the recognition that against her nature, she has been created now through the curse. She has been placed in a position now of submitting, and it's not easy to do that. Whereas before, there was perfect complementary relationship where you never even had to consider what submission was. Now we have all kinds of problems in our marriages because our wives just say, hey, I've got my own mind, I've got my own way, I've got my own job, I've got my own paycheck, and I've got my own designs. And when we do that, we're firmly in rebellion, and we're reflecting exactly what God is speaking about. When he said here, uh, he said, your desire shall be to your husband. That word desire is intense craving or lusting to rule him. You sit down in premarital counseling when I do it. And you go through two or three weeks of it, eventually get, you get to the question to the wives, uh, what are you going to do to change your husband? And the, oh, they have all kinds of ways they're going to change the husband. It's like there's a little list in the back of their head, once we're married, my husband will do this. And it's a lot of fun to open up that little list and talk about it. What are you going to do to change your husband? Because most of the uh, dating relationships are dating a lot of the women when they date are dating with these preconceived notions that once he's mine I'm going to change him it's funny you'll never change him you'll never change you know when men change when they want to the same way that you change when you want to and that's how we change so when you get married with designs on somebody and well I'll make them you know perfect no you won't no 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 never but that's part of our human nature. That's the way that we are. We want to create people. I believe that women do that frequently, and part of it is the mothering instinct that God gave into them, that they want to constantly rule and change. But I'm not saying that's either good or bad. That is a result of a broken relationship with God. And God's word says that when a woman tries to dominate a man, that's out of the will of God, totally. And he said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And so there's the curse, you know, whereas one time there was no thorns, no death, nothing. Now we have all these thorns and all, these, all the sweat that we do when we go out and mow that lawn. It goes all the way back to the curse. Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them, which is the first indication of the death of an animal and is most likely the origin of sacrifices to God. Because in order for them to have skins, they had to kill an animal to make those skins. And I believe that God initiated at this point sacrifice to him. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. 
Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the Tree of Life. And it was in mercy that God told uh, uh, that God drove man out of the garden so that man would not go and eat of the tree of life because had he eaten of that, he would have lived perpetually in his state. God has better things for us now. Now we have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We are being conformed into the image of Christ in eternal life. When we spend eternity with God, we'll be in a beautiful body conformed to his. And so he didn't, in mercy, he did not want the man to remain there and to be tempted to eat of the tree of life in that condition. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. That word Cain means gotten. That's what his name means. And said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And I believe that Eve most likely, by naming him Cain, which means I've gotten a man or gotten from the Lord, I believe that she thought perhaps this man was going to be responsible for helping them to get a right relationship with God, perhaps the deliverer of her and Adam. Now notice something, it doesn't indicate if there were other children born up to this point or not. This will answer one of your questions before you have it. Uh, there are no indications that Cain was the firstborn. It just mentions Cain first. Then she bore again. This time, his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Now, there are those who would say, well, the reason that God did not accept the offering of Cain is because it's obvious that Abel brought a sacrifice to God, which included the blood. And without the shedding of the blood, there's no remission of sin. So it is, a, it is apparent, they would say, that, uh, that the offering of Abel was a better sacrifice offering, and that when, uh, when Cain brought the, the fruit of the ground, which was a result of his tilling and his work and his labor, that he was offering an improper sacrifice to God. And that's not true, because you can offer a grain offering to God and God would accept it. So what was the real problem here? Well, the book of Hebrews tells us in chapter 11 that the reason God had respect for the offering of Abel was because Abel brought it with faith, and Cain didn't. Cain made a religious overture to God, probably gave him his best, but didn't give him his heart, and God didn't accept his sacrifice. The way that God doesn't accept our sacrifice when it's mean meaningless prayer or good works to get close to him and here goes Cain, and he brings this to him, and it's the best I can do. It's not good enough. Why? Because it was not offered in faith. It wasn't offered in faith. Abel's was, and it was accepted. So what happens? Cain gets angry because it shows the arrogance and the pride in him. And he gets angry about this, and the Lord knows it. And the Bible says that his countenance fell. That means that his attitude was very poor, and it was very obvious. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will it not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. In other words, repent, and I'll accept your offering. Offer it in, in faith, and I'll receive it. But if you don't, you're going to be ruled by sin because sin desires to rule you. But if you yield yourself to me in faith, result of Cain's conversation with the Lord. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose against Abel, his brother, and killed him. <laughs> then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. In other words, God, you're unfair for judging me this harshly. All I did was kill my brother. That's where his head's at. That shows the unrepentant heart that he possessed. Am I my brother's keeper? 
Don't we all have rights, individual rights, that we should have for ourselves that nobody should infringe on? Isn't that right and proper? What you do with your own body is your own responsibility, isn't it? And if you do something with your body that I don't like, then I should keep my mouth shut and tell you nothing. So what if you abuse drugs and alcohol? I should let you do that. So what if you think that abortion is a woman's choice and has nothing to do with life in the womb? I shouldn't oppose that. That's your body. That's your right. I don't have the right to tell other people what to do. I don't have the right to impose my moral judgments on anybody. That's what we're told all the time, isn't it? Isn't it? You don't have the right to tell me I'm wrong. You don't have the right to say anything to me. If I want to marry a horse, that's okay. That's the way people think. It's true. As long as it doesn't bother me, as long as it's not hurting me, it's all right. Is it? Aren't we really a society that needs to live together? And without the responsibility of, of a society that cares for itself, will it not be destroyed? And if I fail to love God with my whole heart, soul, strength, and mind, and my neighbor as myself, will I not cease to have a knowledge of community? And will I not become the highest priority in my own universe to the exclusion of others and concern that is natural? Isn't that what's going to occur when I do that? That's what happened with Cain. Cain said, well, you know, it's not my turn to watch him. You know, what have I got to do with him? Am I my brother's keeper? I believe we are. I believe we as Christians are responsible for speaking the truth in love, but speaking it nonetheless. And I believe we need to make our voices heard because, yes, I am my brother's keeper. And it was the sin of Cain that made him even say that. God said, hey, I'm going to judge you. So what did Cain say? Well, my punishment is greater than I can bear. You're too hard on me. So what if I rose up against my brother and killed him? Don't be so harsh. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. That's the guilt that he's now carrying with him. They'll kill me the way I killed him. That's what's going to happen to me. The Lord said to him, Okay, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. So God gave him an awareness that he would not be murdered. The Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Nobody, incidentally, knows what this mark is. Nobody knows what this mark is. But there was some kind of seal that God placed on Cain, which safeguarded him. But nobody knows what it was. Now Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. So the question is, naturally, um, where did Cain get his wife? Generally, people will ask that question. Where did Cain get his wife? Well, it's apparent that they lived hundreds of years, and you'll see this in a minute. And I believe that one of Cain's wives was a descendant from Adam, Adam and Eve the same way he was. It was one of his sisters through the original parents. It would have had to have been. And he got his wife probably after 100, 200 years of Adam and Eve having children and then population growth. And that's where he got his wife. That's where he had had to get his wife. So she con conceived and bore Enoch, and he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Erod, and Erod begot Mehujael, and Mehujael begot Methushael, and Methushael begot Lamech. Now, don't you wish they just had ordinary names? <laughs> Clarence had Joe, and Joe had Bob. <laughs> then Lamech took for himself two wives, now, this is the first instance of polygamy, and I want you to notice that it was a heathen line that introduced it, not a godly line. The name of one was Ada, and the second was Zillah. And Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. That's an interesting name, huh? Jabal and Jubal. <laughs> You know, there's another couple of people that crack me up. Their name is Uz and Buzz. Have you read about them yet? <laughs> oh, Uz and Buzz. They're great. As for uh, Zilla, she bore Tubal-Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. 
and the sister of Tubal Cain was Naaman, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. So wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. This is a puffed up speech of an arrogant man. He said, I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. Now that word young man literally means a small child. He killed a baby because the baby did something to him that he didn't like. Isn't that incredible? That's what he's saying. And it says even a young man, that young man is a small child. And it's like a child bothered him and he killed him. And, and he's bragging about it. That shows the perversion in Cain's line. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. Seth means appointed, the appointed one. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and his name was Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. And this represents a spiritual revival that begins to take place in the godly line of Seth. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Notice they don't mention Cain. Notice they don't mention Abel. They're just speaking about Seth now. And Adam was 130 years old when Seth was born. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years. And he begot sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. And here's your saddest words. And he died which he didn't have to do, but he did. He died. Seth lived 105 years, and he begot Enosh. Now, Enosh is a word that means uh, human frailty, uh, mortal frailty. And he begot Enosh. Seth lived 807 years and begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. Canaan means literally a smith. So there's the first smith, huh? <laughs> After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalaliel. Now that's a hard one for me. Maha. After he begot him, that name uh, means praise of God, in, in, incidentally, Mahalaliel. Canaan lived 840 years and begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. Mahalaliel lived 65 years and begot Jared, which means descent. After he begot Jared, Mahalaliel lived 830 years and begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalaliel were 895 years and he died. Notice the ages are going down a little bit now. You're going to get to Methuselah, and his goes a little bit longer, but they're starting to very slowly die sooner. Jared lived 162 years and be begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and begot sons and daughters. Enoch means dedication. Enoch, according to Jude 14 and 15, is a prophet who made a prophecy of the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. He was a prophet. We're going to see the description of his character in just a moment here. It says, all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. Methuselah means when he dies, judgment comes. That was a prophetic name he gave to his son. When he dies, judgment comes. Speaking of the flood, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. He was translated. He was taken as he was into the presence of God. When it says he walked with God, it means his life was, was totally wrapped up in God. He walked with God. He's the only, there are only two people who are talked about in the Bible who walked with God. Enoch is one of them. And he had a life that was ordered around God himself. And he had a deep and abiding faith in God, had a personal relationship with him, and God raptured him. This is the prefigurement of the rapture of the church. God took him to be with him. He was not, 
and he was only 300, only 365 years old, just a baby. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. Uh, Lamech literally means a conqueror. And after he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. And he's the oldest man recorded in the Bible, 969 years old. Lamech lived 182 years and begot a son, and he called his name Noah, which means rest, saying, now this is a, pro a prophetic saying, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. And he begot Noah. After he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So Lamech, when he named Noah, was speaking about and prophesying about how God was going to deliver mankind. And he gave him a name which means rest to show that God was going to work amongst us through judgment, but also through bringing Noah through it in mercy. And next week as we continue on, we'll see this.